Melissa Mack is a corporate crisis preparedness consultant specializing in establishing, training, and exercising corporate crisis management teams. Her passion is developing and conducting training and tabletop exercises for teams of all maturity levels. Melissa uses her strong attention to detail and deep understanding of team dynamics to, improve, to create exercises that push crisis management, incident management, and business continuity teams to learn and improve. Melissa knows the most effective ways to exercise a senior leadership team, and she's not afraid to use a hurricane, a cyber attack, or a zombie apocalypse scenario to prove it. Today, we're going to be talking about, I'm going to give you a little bit of background about me, about my work, about what crisis management is, what business continuity is, um, and then we're going to look a little into a couple of different case studies about crisis management and corporate crises that have occurred in the publishing industry since the Me Too movement really kicked off. Um, I will caveat this and say that the case studies we're going to be looking at are not clients that I have worked with. I'm using publicly available information, so I'm not giving away anybody's secrets. This is all totally out there public knowledge. Um, but I will help you guys kind of think through how we look at case studies like this from a crisis management perspective. Um, and then we'll finish up with some action items for what you can do to make sure that your organization has a crisis management plan program in place that is efficient, effective. So, some background. Um, why am I here? I promise I'm not going to have an existential crisis in front of you on stage. That's for later this evening over beer. Um, a little bit about me and what I do. I am a corporate crisis preparedness consultant. I work in crisis management and business continuity. Um, I work in private sector only, so I work with companies, with organizations. I don't do any kind of public sector or government work. Um, it's a lot quicker, <laughs> a lot easier, um, but there are loads of folks that work in the public sector as well. Um, I work with a wide range of industries. I've most recently, I've worked with uh, tech, with energy, with retail, with consumer products, manufacturing, all sorts of different industries. Um, I, what else? I am a consultant and I've also been a practitioner, so I've been embedded full time with a client to help embed and implement and roll out their crisis management program. Um, I also, at the moment, am working with several different clients. Um, I will, uh, on a regular basis, write crisis management plans, business continuity plans for companies, train up all of their various team members, and then exercise them to make sure that they know how to use their plan, how to find their plan, um, and what it all means. So they get the opportunity to practice working as a team through a crisis without having to actually go through a crisis. Hopefully, um, some of the crises that I work at, that I that I've included, that I've studied, that I've written exercises scenarios for, include natural disasters, uh, workplace violence, pandemic, um, zombie apocalypse was my favorite. Uh, I do have a quick story for you guys. The first time I convinced a client, and I was trying for years to let me run a zombie apocalypse scenario, uh, I set the scenario in Singapore because they have really good pandemic preparedness protocols because of the SARS outbreak in 2003. Um, and so I set the scenario in Singapore, and I wrote into the scenario. And this is what you do when you create a crisis exercise. You have to build a whole world. I'm kind of a corporate dungeon master. Um, <laughs> that's not on my business card yet. Um, but you have to create a whole world to clearly identify what's going on so that the players have the background knowledge necessary to play through the scenarios. Um, so in the Singapore zombie apocalypse scenario that I created, I followed their pandemic preparedness protocols, so shut down the airport, shut down the ports, shut down all the checkpoints onto the island so that the, the virus wouldn't spread beyond Singapore. What I did not think ahead of time, and this is one of my, I'm ha very happy to share lessons that I've learned, mistakes that I've made so that other people can learn from my mistakes. I didn't give them an out. Um, so I accidentally turned everybody in Singapore into a zombie. <laughs> um, oops. <laughs> um, so if you're designing a crisis exercise, be sure you give them an out. Um, a little bit more about crisis management in general. There are a lot of people that use the term crisis management about what they do. Olivia Pope is not crisis. That's reputation management, that's scandal management, that's not crisis management. Crisis management is holistic, it's comprehensive, it is at a strategic level, it is cross-functional, and there is a response process that happens. In crisis management, we don't call it crisis 
preparedness, or what do you call it crisis preparedness? We don't call it crisis prevention because you can't prevent every single crisis. If you have plans for every single crisis, you have a plan for a hurricane, you have a plan for a building fire, you have a plan for bomb threat. If you have plans for every single different scenario you can think of, the next actual crisis that happens is going to be the thing that you didn't plan for, which is why we help companies prepare for any type of crisis, not every type of crisis. So. Uh, we want to make sure that we can help them mitigate the consequences of the crisis, realizing that sometimes no matter what you do, a crisis will occur. However, when we're thinking through that, we make sure that they take a cross-functional approach at the strategic level and they work to identify their potentially impacted stakeholders. We're going to talk a lot today about stakeholders. When I'm talking about stakeholders in a crisis, I'm talking about anybody who may potentially be impacted by the crisis. So when a company is dealing with a corporate crisis, that can include employees, it can include customers, it can include neighbors, it can include uh, the general public, uh, media, government agencies, regulatory authorities, suppliers, vendors, family members of employees, Joe Schmo on the other side of the world. It can, there are so many different stakeholders. So part of the process of crisis management and responding to a crisis is making sure that you identify who all of our potentially impacted stakeholder groups are. And then you wanna make sure that you've got somebody on your crisis management team who is looking out for each potentially impacted stakeholder group, which is why we generally have these cross-functional crisis management teams established. This is not a hard and fast rule for these are exactly the roles that you have to have on your crisis management team. This is a good starting point for most companies and it will depend on the company, on the organization, how it's structured, what the leadership positions are, things like that, what departments exist at the company. Please have an HR department at your company. Um, <laughs> but generally, these are roughly the roles that we see on a crisis management team. You'll have a team leader. Uh, it might be the CEO of the company, it might not be. It does need to be somebody who is a respected authority figure who has final decision-making authority. Uh, HR is a good one, human resources, communications, you will need to have someone on the crisis management team who is responsible for internal and external communications. So communicating with employees, communicating with the media, with customers, etc. Sometimes that all rolls up into one communications person, sometimes it's two separate communications people. If it's two separate communications people, they both get a seat at the table. Uh, legal, you definitely need a lawyer in the room because a lot of crises will result in litigation. Um, sales or marketing, somebody that's customer facing that knows what your customer's concerns are gonna be, that is able to regularly communicate with your customers, things like that. Um, ops or operations, so depending on what industry it is, what type of company it is, the people that make the things work that eventually give you money to be able to keep the company running, operations. Um, finance because somebody's got to sign the checks. Uh, IT, um, and that can also include cybersecurity. Sometimes if IT, if IT and cybersecurity are two separate departments in your company, then they both need a seat at the table. And then security, physical security. Um, so these are generally the roles that we see on a crisis management team because again, we want to make sure that all of our potentially impacted stakeholders have somebody on the team who is looking out for their needs and thinking about what does this group potentially need in a crisis? How might this crisis impact our customers? How might this crisis impact families of employees, et cetera? There is also a very defined crisis response process, and this is what makes it work. So, and I realize it's small, I'm gonna read it out, it's fine. You've got this response cycle that happens. It starts out in the red with brief. So the crisis management team is activated in whatever method they are activated. They say, we are having a crisis. We are meeting in this room or on this conference bridge line at 4 p.m. today. Everybody show up or dial in. Everybody gets in. You start the meeting with a situation update. Here's what we know. Here's the crisis. Here are the facts that we have so far. You give everybody in, on the team a quick opportunity to provide an update on the situation from their perspective. So if I am the head of HR for a company, I'm gonna need a just two minutes to say, yes, we've identified that we have six employees who are injured, two employees have been killed, for example. Um, but you wanna give everybody no more than two minutes to go around the room or around the call to state the impact of the crisis on the information that they know from their perspective. So we get as much condensed a concise information as quickly as possible right at the beginning of the call. Why? So that everybody on the team is working from the same page. Everybody has the same information. 
Um, we then go into the discussion phase. This is where we can identify what are the key issues that we're tracking. We have employees who are injured. We need to make sure that we notify their families. We need to make sure that we send representatives to the hospital. We need to make sure that they have benefits assistance. We need to communicate about this to the rest of our employees so that they don't find out about it when they see pictures of bodies on social media, for example, things like that. Um, we also, uh, a lot of times this will require collaboration between different team members. Uh, frequently we see that HR, communications, and legal need to work side by side by side on a lot of issues because they need to be lockstep dealing with a lot of these issues in a crisis. Um, also, sales, communications, and your sales folks need to be in touch with each other so that your sales folks aren't off talking to your clients without knowing what the communications people have decided is the core response message. Um, we have the, also during the discussion phase, we do our action planning. So we say, what are the steps that we are going to take to resolve this crisis? What are we going to do about it? You will ideally have a scribe who is tracking this. You will say, we are going to send three people to the hospital to meet with families of employee members who have been injured. Great. Action item. Track it. Write down who's responsible for it and when they, when it's expected to be completed. So we track all that. We have all of our action items and who's doing what. Then. We break, and the team breaks, and they go and they have time to carry out their action items. They also will go work with their support teams, with their departments, to gather more information and to complete their actions. So your communications person that's sitting on the crisis management team is going to have a lot of communicating to do. One person can't do everything, so they're going to need to walk, work with people who are writers to push out the statements, who are listening, who are monitoring social media, who are monitoring employees, listening to employees, and communicating with employees, and also developing the core message that will go out via many channels. So you need that time to have to complete those action items that you've developed as a team. Then, if the crisis is resolved, great. We can deep, we're done, and then later on we'll come back and we'll have a debrief and talk about what lessons we learned, what went well, what we can do to improve. If the crisis is not yet resolved, you start the cycle again, and we go back to the briefing stage. So ideally, when you end your crisis management team meeting, you will set a date and time for the next meeting and say, great, this is good, we'll meet again in two hours. Go carry out your action items. Everybody comes back in the beginning of the next meeting. That's roughly it. So you've got a response cycle, and you complete that cycle as many times as it takes to resolve the crisis. Depending on the type of crisis, the nature of the scenario, you may need to meet every hour on the hour for a week. That would be exhausting, and it would tax all of your resources and all of your people. Everybody would be too tired to make solid decisions. So we recommend have an alternate at each position so that you can do shift work if needed, and also, uh, adjust the, the frequency of your crisis management team meetings as the scenario dictates. So if things are, you're getting less new information as time goes on, as days pass, your team might not need to meet every two hours. You might be okay meeting twice a day. You might be okay meeting once a day. You might be okay meeting twice a week. So be flexible and adjust that as needed, but make sure that you decide before the meeting ends when the next meeting will occur. Whew. Okay, so that's crisis management in a nutshell. Uh, a little bit about business continuity, which we also do. Business continuity is looking at anything that could potentially disrupt your business operations. So we might not have life and death situations, we might not have injuries, we might not have anybody in the outside world knows about it. But if there's something that is going to disrupt your business's ability to operate, and I actually heard a good one this morning on a panel discussion for our librarians talking about if overdrive goes down, that's a business disruption for them. That's huge. Um, so business continuity is operational rather than strategic. It happens at operational levels and tactical levels rather than the top level of an organization. It is function specific and you have response plans for each different process or location instead of just one overall crisis management plan. You probably have several different business continuity plans. When we're looking at business continuity, we look at generally four different areas. People, if there is a disruption to the business, are your people going to be able to work? Or will they need to attend to family members? Will they be trying to resolve their own personal issues? Or can they work? Uh, space, if something happens to your office, to your manufacturing facility, to your plant, and people are not able to physically work there, can they work from home? Or do you need to find alternate workspace for them? IT. Do your people have the IT equipment that they need? Laptops, computers, phones, that kind of thing. And do they have access to the network if needed? 
and then suppliers. And this is a tricky one. So if your company's doing fine, everything's chugging along, everything's great, but you have a supplier that does one thing for you that nobody else does and they have a crisis, they have a business disruption, that could impact you, even if everybody at your company's fine, nothing's wrong with you. So we build in a lot, we try and build in redundancy that way if we can and come up with solutions. That said, there's this whole concept of business continuity management, and this is small, and I just want to show you how it all works together. There's policy program management, setting your whole business continuity policy for the whole organization. You then embed the program, you do an analysis, you do a lot of interviews, you find out what are the biggest risks to our company, to our organization. What's the likelihood of those risks coming to fruition? If those risks do come to fruition, what kind of impact are they going to have on our business, on each of the different processes that they might impact? So you do a lot of interviews, a lot of research, a lot of data, um, and then you come up with your business continuity plans. You design the plans, you implement, so that involves training everybody that might need to use the plans, letting them know the overall response strategy, where the plans are, how to find them, what they mean, et cetera, and then validating, exercising, to make sure that the plans that you've written actually work for the organization. That's business continuity in a nutshell. Um, so a couple of different things that we'll be talking about today. Oh, we're going to be talking also about the Me Too movement, which I feel significantly less qualified to speak about. So I have included some links. The Me Too movement was started by activist Toronto Burke in 2006. The Me Too movement was founded in 2006 to help survivors of sexual violence, particularly black women and girls and other young women of color from low wealth communities, find pathways to healing. Their vision from the beginning was to address both the Darth and resources for survivors of sexual violence and to build a community of advocates driven by survivors who will be at the forefront of creating solutions to interrupt sexual violence in their communities. That's a pretty specific scope that the Me Too movement started as. It's grown significantly since then. Many of you may be familiar when October of 2017, um, the allegations against Harvey Weinstein surfaced publicly and loudly, and all sorts of different people around the globe started using hashtag me too to say, yes, I too have dealt with sexual harassment or sexual assault. Um, and it took off over the weekend. Do y'all remember that weekend that, that, that the hashtag? Yeah, it was everywhere, um, which was amazing to see in that one weekend. Um, it led to things like Time's Up, to the Legal Defense Fund, et cetera, in Hollywood, but it happens not just in the media industry, not just in Hollywood, it affects all industries. Why are we talking about this today? Because this means that for the first time, we are having public societal conversations about sexual harassment and assault, about power and consent, like we really haven't been having at this scale before. This means that there is now significant pressure on companies to not support or employ predators. That's not to say that this is the first time that, that pressure has existed. It is now loud, it is ubiquitous. There are companies that really are suffering consequences for continuing to support or employ predators. Those, that kind of pressure that we're looking at can include brand or reputation. A lot of that pressure comes from social media, which now we have all this voice for people that didn't typically have a voice 10, 15 years ago, and now they do, uh, that can be heard by companies, that can be felt, that can be magnified, that can result in boycotts, it can result in reaching out to advertisers, to have advertisers not support companies, things like that. Financial pressure, this is again a result of social media, but financial pressure comes in many different forms from companies that are dealing with this. Operational, any kind of impact to your operations, and we'll talk about a couple of specific examples of those with our case studies coming up. And internal pressure. Uh, this is a big one that I think gets overlooked a lot. If a company um, has a crisis where they are dealing with they are supporting or employing someone who has become publicly alleged to be a sexual assaulter or sexual harasser, many of the employees of that company may lo no longer feel safe in the workspace. And companies have a responsibility to make sure that they provide a safe workspace for their employees to work. So we get this internal pressure that we really haven't seen publicly and as intensely until now. Um, people are really now more comfortable speaking up and saying, hey, I no longer feel safe working here things like that. Um, this also means that we now have the potential for complex crises that require swift, comprehensive, and nuanced action, and not just a PR response, which is why I want to talk about the intersection of crisis management, crisis management, comprehensive crisis management, not Olivia Pope crisis management, 
actual crisis management, and the Me Too movement, because I think this is an area that a lot of companies are still really struggling to grasp. So my main point today, having a crisis management program in place is the best way to ensure a comprehensive, timely response that meets all stakeholder needs. PR agencies think that they're great at this, they're good at spinning, they're good at putting out a message. Yes, but that is not the whole picture. That does not address all stakeholder needs. So that's what we're talking about today. Um, I've got a couple of case studies that I want to go through. Uh, the first one, and again, these are not my clients. This is all publicly available information. Harper's Magazine. <sighs> there is a, there was a list that was created, and please pardon my language, but it was the name of the list the shitty media men list that was created. It was a virtual whisper network that was created as a Google Doc. Um, people that worked in media created the list as a way to warn other people about people that they felt were sexual predators, sexual harassers, sexual assaulters. Rumors broke out online that Harper's Magazine was preparing to publish a piece by Katie Royfe that would dox the creator or identify, publicly identify and name the creator of the list. People got upset, people got vocal, um, because the idea that doxing the creator of the list would lead to the kind of abuse that the creator of the list was hoping to avoid and hoping to help other people avoid. And then this happened. Nicole Cliff, beloved Canadian writer Nicole Cliff, founder of The Toast, wonderful advice columnist, uh, tweeted about this and said, if you have a piece in the hopper over at Harper's, ask your editor if the Royfe piece is happening. If it is, I will pay you cash for what you'd lose by yanking it, my email. Um, so now we have brand and reputation threat for Harper's Magazine. We have financial impact from Harper's Magazine, because they're about to lose authors and operational, if they don't have any pieces to publish, it's gonna be a skinny magazine. Um, so, let's take a look at what happened. A Couple of the ident different stakeholder groups, this is not all of them, but some of the ones I wanna talk about today. Writers, so people that were writing pieces for Harper's, whether or not they had been published yet or not. Uh, the publisher uh, himself, that publishes Harper's, and then employees that worked at Harper's Magazine. So some of the consequences that each of these stakeholder groups were potentially dealing with. Writers were dealing with personal, financial, and reputation career implications. If I'm a writer and I've got a piece coming out in this issue of Harper's that's going to have this piece that looks like it's going to dox a woman who created this list and it's going to be abusive, I don't know that I want my name associated with that. I don't know that I want that associated with, the, with my career for the rest of my life. So I might feel uncomfortable with that. Um, also, if I'm a writer, I'm probably a freelance writer, maybe. Uh, I can't really afford to tell Harper's, hey, what you're doing is not cool, give me my piece back. Because um, writers typically are not normally independently wealthy folks. Um, they're great, but you know, let's be real. Um, so the publisher has got all of these different potential implications. The reputation of the magazine, especially with social media, folks uh, and the outrage there. It also went mainstream media, not just social media, but other media outlets picked up the story. Um, the financial pressure, um, they did lose advertisers because of this. Um, also, it matters less for this because Harper's Magazine is supported by a nonprofit that is run by the publisher himself. So there are some less of a financial strain there, but the biggest one is the operational. If you've got writers pulling pieces, you are not gonna have much to publish in your magazine. Um, and you also want to maintain high quality magazine, high quality prints. You want high quality pieces, you want really good authors, the best of the best, et cetera. Employees, a lot of employees were feeling that internal struggle that we don't agree with the direction that the magazine is going, we don't like the way this piece is being printed, but I've got rent to pay, I've got, I need to buy groceries. I can't just quit out of protest. Um, eventually, the editor, James Marcus, was fired. Um, and he said in an interview that it was because of his disagreement with the publisher over the Katie Royfe piece. Um, he refused to sign a non-disclosure agreement when he was filed, so he, when he was fired, so he then went public and talked about it, um, which further damaged the reputation of Harper's Magazine and of the publisher. Um, and then more employees were talking publicly about it as well. So four months later, after the whole thing kind of settled down, Advertisers had pulled ads, so we had a financial loss, the editor had quit, other employees had quit, 
And now the VP of Public Relations for Harper's Magazine has given interviews and has been very petty in those interviews, <laughs> saying, oh, the, ma the editor quit. Well, maybe he just didn't think the magazine was good enough, and just ridiculous things in the press that don't look well for anybody, um, especially for Harper's. Um, so that means a couple of points. To me, looking as a crisis management professional, some things that went wrong here that could go better. There really seemed to be only one decision maker, and that was the publisher. It did not seem to me like they had a cross-functional crisis management team in place to deal with this. Um, stakeholders were not identified and therefore got ignored. Employees especially, writers especially, were not, they didn't sit there and think through what do these people need in this crisis. There did not seem to be a response process. There just seemed to be people giving interviews to the New York Times off the cuff, which is not the best way to respond to a crisis. Um, so a lot of things that they could have done better here to try and identify who their stakeholders are and meet their needs better. Second case study I want to talk about. Simon & Schuster, a tale of two book deals. <sighs> This one, I'm sorry, I need to take a breath. <laughs> this makes me mad. Um, Milo Yiannopoulos, who is known for writing, uh, he was a editor for Breitbart, which is an alt-right website. Uh, he is known for writing views that are white supremacist, that are racist, that are anti-Semitic, that are misogynist. Uh, very controversial, to say the least. Signed a deal with an imprint of Simon & Schuster, got a $250,000 book deal. Um, which caused some concern um, among authors and among employees at Simon & Schuster and among readers. Um, so <laughs> eventually this happened. The CEO, and I'm going to read this. I realize it's small. I'm going to read the whole thing. Don't worry about it. Um, and it's a lot to read, but I think it's really important to recognize good examples of crisis communications. This actually is, I think, a pretty good example of crisis communications. So. The CEO of Simon & Schuster, Carolyn Reedy, sent a letter to her employees. Dear colleagues, in the past few weeks, I have heard from many of you, either directly or through your managers, regarding the threshold additions, the imprint, uh, acquisition of Dangerous by Milo Yiannopoulos. I have also heard from some of our authors, bookselling accounts, and members of the reading public. Your opinions are not taken lightly, and while we are clearly in the middle of a controversial situation, I am gratified by your obvious pride in working for Simon & Schuster and that you care enough and have taken the time to be in touch. Attached is a letter being distributed to our authors who, are communicated, who have communicated with us about this matter. If you have been contacted by authors who do not also write to me, feel free to send this letter on to them. It will also be posted on our author portal. I hope you will read the letter and be assured that above all else, we will not publish a book that we consider to be hate speech. So, step one that went well. They sent the communication to employees and to authors at the same time. That's a good alignment of internal and external communication strategy. Well done, Simon & Schuster, for that. The letter that was sent to authors. And I apologize, I'm just gonna read the whole thing because I think it's important to hear. Good work. Dear author, I'm writing to you regarding the controversy surrounding the book Dangerous by Milo Yiannopoulos. Since Threshold Editions announced their plans to publish, we have received many comments from you and many of our authors and readers expressing concern and displeasure. I want you to know that we take all of this feedback seriously and appreciate that so many people, especially our authors, have taken the time to communicate with us. First and foremost, I want to make clear that we do not support or condone, nor will we publish hate speech. Not from our authors, not in our books, not in our imprints, not from our employees, and not in our workplace. I think that's a good statement. It's a good coverage statement of what they're about. That said, they did still give him a $250,000 book deal. When Threshold Editions met with Mr. Yiannopoulos, he said that he was interested in writing a book that would be a substantive examination of the issues of political correctness and free speech, issues that are already much discussed and argued and fought over in both mainstream and alternative media and on campuses, and I lost my place, and in schools across the country. Threshold Editions, like all of our imprints, is tr editorially independent. Its acquisitions are made without the involvement or knowledge of our other publishers. In considering this project, the imprint believed that an articulate discussion of these issues coming from an unconventional source like Mr. Yiannopoulos could become an incisive commentary on today's social discourse that would sit well within its scope and mission, which is to publish works for a conservative audience. Once Threshold made an offer to Mr. Yiannopoulos, our responsibility as a publisher is to work with him to produce the book he and our staff envisioned, and one that adheres to the standards that I have articulated. We promise to do just that. 
I like that because it does say, here's what happens, here's what we're going to do about it. There is no question that we are living in a time when many are feeling uncertainty and fear. It is a moment when political passions are running hotter and stronger than at any time in recent history and cultural divides across the country seem to be getting wider, demonstrating understanding of concern. And so I can appreciate the strong opinions and feelings that this has stirred in you and others. I also recognize that there may be a genuine debate to be had about who should be awarded a book contract. For us, in the end, it ultimately comes down to the text that is written. And here, I must reiterate that neither Threshold Editions nor any of other of our imprints will publish books that we think will incite hatred, discrimination, or bullying. Thank you for taking the time to read this. Pretty decent crisis communication statement, released at the same time as the internal statement, acknowledges what the issue is, demonstrates that they have been listening, that they understand the concerns, states what those concerns are to, met, to let us know that they, that they understand the concerns, state what they're going to do about it, work with the author to make sure that it, the book ultimately does not include hate speech. As you may know, Roxane Gay had a deal with an imprint of Simon Schuster, and she pulled the book as a result of this. That's a big deal. Roxane Gay is a big deal, but you all already know that because you've got the data from BookNet Canada. Um, so one thing that I thought stuck out was this tweet. So she, Roxane Gay gave a statement. She said, I guess the news is out. Everything I need to say is in my statement. I can afford to take the stand. Not everyone can remember that. An employee at Simon Schuster's replied to that and said, as Simon Schuster's employee, thank you so much for doing this. That to me is key because that Simon Schuster's employee probably did not feel empowered to take a stand at work in front of her CEO, things like that. Um, so that to me is an example of the different kind of impact that stakeholders might be feeling and how those needs get expressed and how those needs get hurt by the crisis management team. So stakeholders, including but not limited to authors that had books with Simon Schuster, including Roxane Gay, uh, the publisher of the company itself, uh, shareholders in the company as well, that's another one to consider, um, and then employees at Simon & Schuster. Uh, so authors don't want to be associated with a publisher that publishes hate speech. That's general rule of thumb, for most authors anyway. Um, also, most of them can't afford to pull books, and Roxane Gay recognized that in her statement. Um, another thing to consider, many of the authors are probably have close working relationships with the editors who are employees at Simon & Schuster, so they're probably feeling some concern for their editors who are feeling this more so within Simon & Schuster. Uh, the publisher of the company lost money and a marketing cycle and operations from the Roxane Gay book. They lost a Roxane Gay book that they didn't get to publish. It still, I don't think, has been published. I would really like to read it. Somebody pick it up. Um, Simon & Schuster now has a reputation as being willing to publish hate speech. That's not great. Um, employees were very unhappy, vocally, both internally and on Twitter. Um, employees feel ashamed and unsafe. I personally would not want to work in some place that is seen as promoting with $250,000 hate speech. That's just me. Um, another big consequence. Huh, this is a good one. So. Adam Morgan, who's the head of the Chicago Review of Books, decided that the Chicago Review of Books would not cover any authors published by Simon & Schuster in 2017. That's a big one. That's a hit financially, reputation, operationally to Simon & Schuster. The crisis ultimately resolved itself about a month later when Simon & Schuster let Mila go because he talked about how pedophilia was a good thing. Um, Great. <laughs> that was sarcasm for the record. Um, so they did not ultimately publish his book. Um, however, Chicago Review of Books, even though he was let go by Simon & Schuster in February of 2017, Chicago Review of Books did not review a single Simon & Schuster book in 2017. They stuck to that for the entire year as they said they would, even though the crisis kind of was resolved by February. That's still 10 months of consequences to face from this crisis. <sighs> Some analysis. Um, better, but not great. Proactive communications to key, but not all stakeholders. As I mentioned, the idea of sending out the communication to employees and to external audiences at the same time is a good one because it is 2019 now and social media exists. If you issue a statement to your employees, they're going to be tweeting about it right away. Um, consequences persisted long after the situation was resolved. Chicago Review of Books. Um, in 
my opinion, I think that this crisis could have been handled better if there was clear notification and escalation process. If someone at Threshold Editions had realized, you know what, we just gave $250,000 to this person who, A, already has a significant platform for hate speech, doesn't really need another one, and B, uses hate speech all the time. Some way to send that up the flagpole to someone at Simon & Schuster headquarters to say, hey, we think this is a potential to be a corporate crisis, we need to deal with this. I think that would have prevented a lot of what went on. So, I'm breathe for a second. Um, some action items that I wanna talk about. What you can do if you're, to ensure that your company is prepared to respond to any type of crisis. If you are not a senior leader at your company, if you are an employee, you're not a C-suite level person, great. There's still stuff you can do. Ask if there's a crisis management program in place. Ask what roles are on that, who's on the crisis management team, what roles are on that team. Make sure it's not just communications people. Um, ask how to notify the crisis management team about a potential corporate crisis. Ask if I become aware of something that I think is gonna impact the company, who do I let know about that and how do I let them know? Great question to ask. Um, if you are a senior leader at your company, there are some things you can do. Ensure that the crisis management team includes representation for all potentially impacted stakeholders. Again, that it's not just communications. Uh, ensure that there is an activation method to get the team together in a room or on a call and that activation method works. Ensure that activation authority is clearly defined, that everybody on the team knows who has the authority to activate the team and how they do that. Um, and make sure that the crisis management team is trained, that they know how to find and use their crisis management plan, and that they exercise regularly. A team that is not trained, does not know where to find their plan, does not exercise, they're not exercised, is not a team. That's just some people hanging out in the corner not doing anything. And that is my spiel. Any questions? I wonder if, I, I guess hearing, hearing the, even uh, the, the case studies and the background and the theory does it ever go right? Like, is anyone ever hit with a crisis where they go to the filing cabinet where there's a crisis plan and they pull it out and they say, "Gall darn it, here it all is. Everyone get in line. <laughs> Great question. Does a crisis ever go right? So that requires a bit of perspective. Do people follow the plans? Do they follow the process? Do they do what they're supposed to do? Yes. Does that mean that there are still consequences? Does that mean that there are still bad things that happen? Sometimes, yeah. Um, one of my favorite examples, um, a company that you've heard about in a crisis, BP. Everybody remembers the Deepwater Horizon spill in 2009. That one was not the one that they handled well. Um, that's the one that got their CEO transferred to Siberia. Um, one that they actually had an oil spill in California on Newport Beach in 1990. Newport Beach, California, that's one of the wealthiest communities in the United States. A lot of wealthy people there who would complain, and you know if wealthy people are impacted by the crisis, they're gonna get, it's squeak wheel gets the grease, rich people get all the money, that's what's gonna happen. So they're gonna get the attention, they're gonna get the outrage, they're gonna get the media coverage of it too. That crisis isn't, wasn't covered hardly at all because BP actually followed their protocols there, they did what they were supposed to do, they talked with the community members, they talked with their employees, they dealt with it, everything kind of according to their response process, and they did a good job with that one. But then Deepwater Horizon happened. Great question. Hi. Hi. Uh, my question is, what are your suggestions for scaling this down for companies that are quite tiny? Um, and wouldn't have enough members to like make up that full team? Great question. What would I suggest for companies that are small and might not have enough members to make up that full team? So, rely on resources that the company currently uses. If you have external legal counsel, great. They're the legal representative on the crisis management team. If you have a PR agency, they get a seat on the crisis management team too. Ideally, it's someone who do you have a working relationship already so you're not bringing in new people and making introductions in the midst of a crisis? Rely on resources that you use already. If you have an accountant that you rely on, they're your finance member of the team. That said, especially if you're pulling in external members to help out, they've got to go through the training and, and know where the plan is and how to use it as well. They've got to participate in the exercises as well because those team dynamics are crucial in the time of a crisis. The whole idea of crisis management and preparing and planning and training is to make sure that you're removing as many obstacles as possible in advance of a crisis. So you don't have to make introductions. You don't have to worry about why is this person reacting to the thing that I said that way? Oh, 
that's how that person is. I know what's going on here. You don't have to worry about any of that in a crisis. So that you're trying to remove as many of those obstacles as possible. That said, if it's a small company, you might not have an IT person. I've been the IT person for a company before, and I have a degree in music. I'm not an IT person. So you, do, you make do with what you got. Um, make sure that you stick to the response process is the big thing. Be very disciplined about that. And it's a good idea to have a process guardian to make sure, to make sure that somebody is in charge of saying, we're about to end this meeting, when do we meet again? And make sure that that's clearly communicated to everyone. That'll go a long way, is following that response process will go a long way. Good question. Thank you all so much for your time. I appreciate it.